All right. Well, it's the beginning of Women's History Month, and my mission in life is for every woman to live fulfilled from start to finish every single day. And in order to move that forward, move that mission forward, as well as honor Women's History Month, today I want to give you three ways to always have time, energy, and business. So I'm Angie Beeman with Clutch Businesses, and I help female entrepreneurs move from hustle to flow by streamlining and automating their operations. And what this does is it allows them to spend more time spreading their special sauce and less time on the busy work. So I'm really about playing bigger rather than focusing on productivity. So before we dive in, I want to ask... Uh, does, does anybody feel like they have enough time every single day? So I'm going to guess that a lot of you are struggling to find enough time. I know that I am. I know so many people that are. So in the chat, I want you to tell me uh, who or what suffers most when you don't have enough time. So I'm going to guess again that it's you. It's your business. It's your kids. I don't even have to say this, but it feels terrible, right? It probably feels so bad that you can't even see a way out of it. And I totally get that. And you're absolutely not alone. So I've said this before, and I will absolutely say it again, that women are so good at doing whatever it takes to get the job done. It's exceptional. Uh, but because we're so good at just grinning and bearing it, we're not always great at finding ways to make things easier on ourselves. And we kind of believe that it's supposed to be hard, right? So as we talk today, I, I really want to challenge you to embrace the idea that you deserve to live a full and satisfying life. So let's talk about how you can make that happen. So we're going to look at three areas in your business that will free up your time and your energy to invest in other things without seeing a dip in your profits. So we are going to find ways to automate tasks that suck time and joy um, and ways to streamline complicated processes and all without losing your personality or your incredible customer experience as a result. And then we're gonna look at ways to reduce expenses because we wanna make sure that your expenses are lean and mean so that you're spending money on the right things and not duplicating services. And then we're also gonna talk about developing new channels or products so you can serve customers that you aren't, but you wish that you could, or you can launch the product you've always dreamt of, or maybe you can start to talk to your customers in a new and a more effective way. So I've used these same strategies in all of the companies and organizations that I've worked with, and they've seen incredible results. And I'm talking, they've seen 35% more time. So 35% of their time returned to them. They've seen an increase in their revenue up to four times what it was before. They've also started to see an enhanced in customer experience. So their customers are happier as a result of these changes. And all of this is happening without them spending any more money than they already were. And then at the end of all of this, they find that they've got greater passion for what they're doing every single day, which is pretty freaking incredible. So let's start with automations. So we've all been checking out at the store when the register tape runs or the register itself runs out of receipt tape. So the cashier is quickly trying to remedy the situation while also keeping you engaged and happy as the customer. And to be honest, they're not doing a great job at either of those things, right? So this is how I like to think about automations in, in business. I think a lot of companies think that automations are going to end up stripping them of any personality, um, that customers won't feel connected 
and they'll eventually go somewhere else. So looking back at the receipt tape, if the tape, if the tape itself hadn't run out, the cashier could have continued talking with you about the super cozy sweater you're buying. But instead, her process broke down. So she's scrambling to find another roll of tape, but because this happens so infrequently, it's buried under a ton of different things around the register, right? And the other thing is because it happens so infrequently, she's forgotten how to load it into the register. So instead of making eye contact with you and meaningful conversation, she just asked you for the second time if you have kids and she kind of nodded distantly um, at your response. So one minute of meaningful conversation or meaningful connection turns into the equivalent of talking to a teenager with AirPods in. And the same is true for your business. So putting cumbersome processes in place or no process at all distracts you and your employees from providing the best experience for your customers. So the first place that I like to look for automations is, uh, or for possible automations in a business are with the tasks that you and your employees do every single day. And I'm not talking about the ones that you tell your friends that you do. I'm talking about the dirty and the boring ones that you intentionally don't tell your friends about. So I am absolutely happy to be proven wrong about this, but I would bet that almost 30% of those could be automated or eliminated entirely. So I had a client running a one-on-one -on -one consulting business as a side hustle, and she spent 10 to 15% of her time setting up appointments with clients and gathering paperwork and information from them that they would use um, during their sessions. So finding a time to meet was unrelated, like completely unrelated to the magic that happened in the sessions and during their sessions. But she was spending a pretty significant chunk of her time doing it. So she was spending that time because when she started her business, she, well, she was spending that time because she didn't have an automation in place, right? So when she started her business, she just didn't know how successful it was going to be. Like I said, it was a side hustle for her. And there weren't as many options at that point for reasonable and easy to use scheduling software. So once she started getting really busy, once business took off, it was actually, it felt easier for her to just keep doing it the way that she was. For her, it wasn't taking that much time. It was easier than like just taking a step back and researching the options and putting something in place. I'm sure that, you know, we can all relate to that. So for her, we were able to find a really cheap scheduling software that allowed her clients to book online, and it also automatically collected and stored the documents and information she needed from them um, prior to their meeting. So rather than hunting them down, trying to get that information, it was just part of the, the appointment booking. So the software created client files that could be built upon as they work together. So really similar to like the doctor's office. And before that, she had previously, like I said, been hunting them down for that information and then manually filing it on her computer or, you know, wherever she, wherever she was at the time. So implementing a scheduling software is probably a no brainer for you, but the feeling of, I know it could be better, but I'll just make it work is probably familiar to all of us. It shows up often in your business and I know it doesn't mind. And the 10 to 15% of her time that we reclaimed didn't provide less of a service to her customers or to her clients. In fact, it probably enhanced the experience because they weren't going back and forth trying to find a time or find, you know, trying to find dates in the midst of everything else that they themselves had going on. So she could either reinvest the, the time in being better prepared for her sessions or seeing more clients, or she could head to the spa if that's what she wanted to do. It was really up to her. Now, another consideration uh, when thinking about automations is to look at opportunities to clarify and clean up your service offerings. 
So is there a question or maybe there are questions that you and your staff are fielding frequently from customers? If so, this usually means that there's some confusion for your customers in, in what you're offering. So another client of mine had a, a coaching business that offered two types of services when we first started working together. They were essentially the same thing, but one was meant for, um, for new clients and the other was meant for existing clients. Now, the one for existing clients uh, was 15% cheaper. So new clients were always trying to book that because her customers weren't trying to give her more money if they didn't have to. So almost every new client asked which one they should be booking. So instead of her connecting with new clients about how beneficial her services would be for them, her first contact was usually focused on what service was the best fit for them. And that should be obvious to anybody interested in doing business with you. So for her, we removed the existing client session from the offerings listed on her site and still made it available in her CRM so that she could send it to specific clients to purchase and book. And honestly, she was doing that before anyways. Uh, but now she didn't have to spend the time clarifying up front for every single client and potential client, which was a huge time saver for her. Okay, so then uh, let's actually journey on from uh, automations to expenses. So as you grow, everything changes in your business. The needs of you and your customers change, the technology changes, what you have to leverage changes. It all looks different from when you first started. So if your costs aren't being reviewed holistically on a regular basis, you may find that you're spending time focused on bringing in business that you don't actually need. So you can start by reviewing your relationships with your suppliers. So I'm actually curious if anybody has an example of successfully going back to their suppliers or vendors, you know, whatever terminology you use, and coming back on top that they'd be willing to share. I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear these success stories. So most of the companies that you write checks to base their pricing on the volume of business that you do with them. So each year or maybe even every six months, you can reach out to your suppliers to show them the growth since you last connected and, and also the growth that you're projecting for the next year. And they'll likely be able to lower your fees um, if, if there's been significant growth or if, if you will have significant growth. So suppliers for, this would include suppliers for everything from software to physical products or even materials. And if even if you haven't grown in your business, but you feel like your pricing is actually holding you back from the growth that you expected, share that with them. Um, if it's clear that dropping your prices X amount uh, would make you that much more competitive, they might be willing to invest in you. And Honestly, if they're not open to either of these options, you can always look for another vendor. I mean, in, I think in a vendor, uh, a vendor relationship, it's all about partnership. And if you're showing up to the partnership, but the other person isn't, there are always other fish in the sea. And um, you know, giving you something specific here, payment processing companies are a great place to start. So they often have like an introductory rate of, you know, 2.75% or something like that. But if you're doing uh, more than $25,000 annually with them, they'll give you a better rate than that. So depending on your business, that could be really meaningful to your margins. Okay, so another place to look regularly is at the services you're paying for to see if there are any redundancies. So there have been so many changes in the software as a service industry over the last five to 10 years. I mean, honestly, even in the last one to two years. So this is like newsletter services, CRMs, marketing platforms. All of those started out really laser focused on one thing, one really specific thing. 
But as people built add-ons or plugins um, to fill a beefier need, many that started out, uh, you know, with just one feature now have hundreds of things that you can do with them. So uh, MailChimp and Constant Contact come to mind for me here. So back in the day, newsletter platforms used to be just that. You could send a newsletter to your list. You might even be able to schedule it in advance. And as the online business world grew, plugins were built to allow you to do more with the same list that you built. Um, so I set up a client actually years ago with a newsletter service um, as well as a drip campaign tool. So they were paying um, a monthly fee for the newsletter and a monthly fee for the drip campaign. But now, a few years later, the newsletter service actually offers a drip campaign tool with their regular monthly subscription. So it's not much of a cost on its own, but when you add those types of things together, you can significantly reduce your monthly costs by using all of your platforms to their full potential. Okay, so I also want to you know, bring back cleaning or clarifying your offers um, here as well. So the same client that we talked about earlier with kind of the confusing offerings also offered, now stick with me here, she also offered mock interviews, a mock interview with written feedback, and a mock interview with written feedback and audio. So three different services, uh, basically just with additional things added on to them. Now in the mock interview itself, so just the, the basic service, feedback was given to the client. So it was, it was said out loud to them. And if they wanted that written feedback, um, or if they wanted the, the written feedback, my client would actually spend 45 minutes after the session was done, typing up the feedback she shared during the session. So it wasn't, she wasn't giving them additional feedback. It was just documenting the feedback that was already given. And then she would email it to the client. And that was for her basically doubling the amount of time that she was spending, but she wasn't charging double because clients wouldn't pay double for just a, a written typed up piece of paper, right? So because her time investment was so much greater, um, it was costing her more to do those sessions with the add-ons um, than, and she wasn't making as much as she was with just the, the basic service, right? So she was actually already meeting all of her clients remotely. So we had her shift from regular phone calls to using a free conferencing platform that offers free recordings, and then those can just be automatically transcribed. Now, this is, uh, isn't familiar to any of us today, right? We're all living through a pandemic and we're all living and breathing Zoom or some kind of Zoom alternative. But rather than um, typing notes that repeated what she had shared in those sessions, like I said, the recording of the session was transcribed and then that was what was given to the client. Now, a free service, so Zoom and this transcription service, um, made that add-on the same price as the basic service. But she could actually charge more for it because for her customer, there was an added value. Okay, now the next thing is that make sure that you're actually getting a return on your investments. And again, this is, you know, you might want to consider all of your vendor relationships and all of the things that you're paying for, right? So I would start by asking questions like, um, is the marketing company that you're working with actually converting clients? And if you don't know that answer, you can ask them for a monthly report so that it's always top of mind. Uh, you can also ask, are, are there areas that you're not spending money, but you should? So another client of mine um, was doing a killer job of bringing in thousands of dollars in business and making sure that every one of those clients was incredibly satisfied with the service that they were providing. But in that case, the person responsible for generating the business was the same person responsible for invoicing those clients after their projects were complete. And it wasn't happening. So luckily, she was the owner of the company, or she would have been relieved of her duties a long time ago. 
Um, but for her, there was a block. There was something holding her back that wouldn't allow her to ask for what she had earned. So she just wasn't doing it um, unless the client asked for it. So because in they didn't actually have revenue, so they they had a lot of potential revenue, but they didn't have any checks to cash. She was of the mindset that they couldn't afford to hire anybody to do that invoicing portion. So after understanding the cycle that she was in um, and that she did have the money if it was just collected, they ended up hiring a, a part-time accountant. So just somebody part-time to handle issuing and collecting on those invoices. And this one change, just this one change has tripled their revenue and they've doubled their headcount in less than two years. So in this case, the ROI was so strong that investing that money was absolutely worth it for them. Okay, now this last one initially sounds like it might be a little bit of a, se a sensitive subject. So we're going to talk about headcount. Now, this is coming from the perspective of somebody that has time and time again automated herself out of a job. But I do think that it's important to consider the folks that you have on your payroll and if what they're doing is necessary. Now, notice that I didn't say if they were necessary, but if what they were doing is necessary. So automations, in my mind, can create uh, an incredible company culture of mentorship and career development. So if you're able to cover somebody's salary right now um, and you can find ways to automate some of their tasks, that frees them up to take uh, more off of somebody else's plate. So they can slowly take on more and develop skills to grow with your company. And the time that they free up from for others uh, can be used to focus on additional sales or other revenue channels, or instead of working more than 60 hours a week, you get 20 hours a back or you know, 20 hours a week back without spending any more money. Okay, so now that we've got automations and expenses covered, let's move to new revenue channels and new product. And that might sound a little scary. It might feel a little scary. Um, so more products usually means more work, but once you've automated parts of your business and you've gotten your expenses in order, you should actually have space to fill. So even if you don't want to fill that space with more work, you can probably use what you already have in a, a new way that opens up a new market. Or you could hire somebody like me to implement the idea in a fully automated way, like a fully automated way, so that it takes on kind of a passive income vibe. So a client I worked with had a consulting business. I guess we're kind of talking about a lot of consulting businesses today, but um, they, so they had a consulting business, but they also wrote books as a way to reach those that couldn't afford uh, the regular services. So the books were a really good way to reach this diverse audience, but between writing, editing, and publishing, she ended up spending 60% of her time on the books that were only generating 15% of her revenue. So 60% of her time for 15% of her revenue. Since video is the wave of the future, um, we moved her to an online course format to reach those same folks. So all she had to do was record herself talking about what she already knew like the back of her hand. I mean, she could have even recorded live one-on-one -on -one sessions with her clients and turned those into lessons. So either way, it took much less time to create the content and she could offer the information in a format that spoke to her customers in a more direct way. So the goal in that case was to align her time investment and her revenue more closely. But what actually happened is that her revenue ended up growing well beyond what would have justified the time that she was spending. Okay, so the three ways that you can always have time energy, and business 
are automations, reducing expenses, and adding new revenue streams or new products. Now, I want to make sure that you are walking away with some actionable things for your business. So I want to know what questions you have for me so that so that we can make that happen. So the idea is not that you will copy and paste these exact ideas or these examples into your business because every one of your businesses is completely different, right? But you will start to see uh, similar patterns and you'll be able to apply similar strategies because, I mean, you're smart. You started and are running a, a really great business. So you will find great solutions if you're looking for them. Now, many of the examples that I've given are really minor changes that created really big shifts. So I'd love to hear how you're going to use this. And to do that, you can email me at hello at clutchbusinesses.com. And then I'd also like to offer, in celebration of Women's History Month, a $500 business evaluation. Now, these are done for all of our clients. And, and what they do is they'll show you how in your specific business, um, the changes that you could implement to get 35% of your time back or increase your revenue and have happier clients as a result. So to find out if, if that's what you need in your business right now, you can book a free 30-minute consultation with me uh, by visiting uh, clutchbusinesses.com slash let's meet. And what I'll say to that is I, I hope that we get a chance to talk. I hope we get a chance to connect and let's make history.